Okay, so good afternoon and welcome to Coastal Oceanography and the Inland Waters session. Uh, this is part two and my name is Go Chi Han uh, from Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And uh, we have uh, five presenters in this session and the first speaker has 30 minutes. So first of all, I would like to introduce our uh, welcome um, Dr. Sanfei Lin, and he's going to present um, interactions between surface waves, tides, and storm surges over the Northwest Atlantic. Uh, Sanfei? Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, I was a PhD student working with Professor Jing Sheng at Dalhousie. Uh, my name is Shang Fei Ling. And now a postdoc at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. So uh, I will present some of my PhD research focusing on uh, uh, wave evolution and wave kind of interaction. So I changed the title a little bit because I have more time. So here's the outline. So after the introduction, I will present uh, the research result focusing, oh, sorry, focusing on the four important physical processes and then summarize in the end. So wind wave is one of the most important features at the ocean surface. However, its effect has been overlooked in the ocean circulation models for a long time. So here we try to investigate the wave evolution and the effect of wave current interactions in the Northwest Atlantic. So after the receiving the, after receiving energy from the wind, the wave energy can, can be transferred among different uh, frequencies and, and then dissipated through wet capping or swell dissipation. And when those waves propagate into shallow waters, they will break due to limited water depths. And uh, those breaking waves can provide energy source for longshore or rip currents in coastal regions. And wave propagation are also affected by ocean currents through the relative wind effect or the spatial advection by, uh, by currents or the wave number shift of wave energy due to currents and also due to the uh, gradient of current can cause the current induced wave reflection. And waves in turn can affect the air sea exchange and modify the wind stress experienced by ocean currents. And waves can also enhance the mixing of upper layer ocean and have additional forcing on, on, on currents through the radiation stress or the uh, vortex force associated with stoke drift. So at the bottom, the wave orbital movement can enhance the bottom, bottom stress experienced by ocean currents. And uh, this study, the region is Northwest Atlantic, and which is a dynamically complicated with complex circulation patterns and strong tidal flows in some subregions and uh, the presence of sea ice in the high latitude. So this region is also frequently affected by hurricanes and winter storms, which uh, drive strong currents and uh, surface waves. And the main objective of this study is to examine important physical processes for wave evolution and the wave current kind of interactions in, in this region. So there are many important scientific questions remain to be addressed. And we are going to focus on some of them. The first one is how do the currents and sea ice affect wave evolution in the Northwest Atlantic? And how can we get accurate wave simulation in this um, dynamically complex region? And we also try to quantify the role of uh, surface waves in the air sea exchange. And the, the third question is, in shallow waters, how do the topography and the wave conditions can affect the depth-induced wave breaking, which is important for the wave current in action in coastal regions. In the, in the end, we, we, want to, we want to know what are the effects of the of wave current in actions in this region. So the first part, we first explain four sustain packages known as ST2346 for the wind input and the wave dissipation 
using a one-way couple the wave circulation ice model based on uh, uh, wave loss three. So in spectral wave model, because the source term packages for the wind input in the wave dissipation were usually tested for simple wave conditions. And it is important to have accurate wave simulations in the presence of sea ice and uh, strong currents. And this is the precondition for our following study. This animation shows the wind forcing during the winter storm period and the hurricane off layer in 2011. So the sea state during the winter storm period were dominated by wind waves due to the large scale winter storm. And uh, during uh, hurricane off layer, sea state over the regions away from hurricane center. And the sea state were dominated by swells. So here I present the relative size of simulated significant wave height using different packages and during both periods. The show on the left during the winter storm, the model results show that the package ST6 has the best performance as indicated by the black marks. So you can see uh, the, 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 this is due to that packages ST6 has the strong wind input and the fast wave wave growth. Therefore, ST6 reduced the underestimations uh, of wave height in several other packages. Well, during the hurricane off layer, when um, sea states were dominated by swells away from hurricane, this ST6 uh, has different performance, but slightly overestimated, slightly underestimated the, the wave height but it still has the best of performance. So it has different performance under different uh, uh, C state. We then can investigate the effects of current in sea ice on wave propagations. So here is a quick example. We compare the observed wave height from altimeter with a uh, uh, model result with current and without current. So the model result with current, with current indicated by the black solid line. And you can see the observed large spatial availability due to currents along the track can be simulated by including the current effect as indicated by the uh, black solid line. And spatial variability is mostly caused by the uh, gradient of currents as indicated on the right panel uh, by the blue line. So the effect of uh, which can cause strong, um, strong um, current induced wave refraction. And the effect of sea ice on wave propagation, of, I'm sorry, you can see the effect of sea ice on wave propagation is shown um, can on uh, um, by the difference in the significant wave height and wave period. So the presence of sea ice reduced the wave height as a result of wave attenuation in the ice and the reduction of wind input as the sea surface was covered by the uh, ice. The mean, the mean wave period are generally increased in the ice, so as the rap, um, high frequency wave energy are more rapidly decayed in ice. So ice effect becomes stronger over regions with higher ice concentration. And you can, it should be noticed that there's a region uh, in the Gulf of Lawrence, uh, uh, the wave height are increased over the center of uh, Gulf St. Lawrence, which is actually due to the wave reflection and the wave scattering in the ice. So the scat wave scattering in the ice, pro this process is usually ignored um, in many previous studies, but actually it is also important. So here we actually consider both the wave attenuation and the wave scattering processes in, in ice by using uh, not only ice concentration, but also the ice thickness and the flow size from data, uh, uh, using data from Canadian Ice Service. So next, as mentioned in, in previous, the formulas of drag correction used in the uh, source term packages have some limitations. So as wave effects are not well represented. So here we try to quantify the effect of waves on the wind stress and at, at the sea surface. So wind stress is normally estimated from the wind speed using the Buckle formula in terms of the drag coefficient. And the drag coefficient is usually considered a as a function of wind speed. So we first collect the observational data and of wind stress and uh, 
uh, wave data from a field experiment. And these data um, were collected under a wide range of wind and wave conditions. This figure here shows the drag coefficient as uh, function of wind speed using these data. So the black dots represent the uh, being averaged values of the observed drag coefficient. So one of the important features is that the widely used uh, um, widely used skin, such as large and form of one's skin, they do not represent the enhanced drug coefficient at low winds. Alternative, alternatively, the drug coefficient can be related with the sea surf roughness, which has a, a smooth flow component due to viscosity and a rough flow component affected by surf waves. So in this study, we proposed a new formula based on observation from eight field experiment. So in the new formula indicated by the black lines, actually the sea surface roughness has different dependencies on the, uh, on the wave age and the different uh, sea state, which is different from um, previous studies. So young waves can have large values of drag coefficient and the wing, sweat, wing sea dominated and the mixed sea state but other waves may have uh, uh, larger values and as well dominant the sea state. And we then compare the um, calculated, uh, uh, calculated uh, friction velocity with observational data. And we can see uh, this new formula indeed can have uh, a better performance than, uh, than other previous schemes. So to further assess the performance for different schemes uh, used in a similar one way, Couple of wave simulation as model for wave simulation. And this figure shows the being average relative bias of a significant wave height for model result using four different skins. And the new skins has the best of performance as indicated by the black marks, so which reduce the underestimation of wave height at low, at low winds and uh, uh, reduce the overestimation of wave height at high winds. This is actually due to that, the different values of drug coefficient in different skins. So you can see the new skin is the only one that can represent an enhanced drug coefficient at, at low wings, as we mentioned previously. And uh, this is why we can see the improvement of new skin. And we can have similar uh, conclusions for, for the, for the performance under different wave age. So we then investigated the process for depth-induced wave breaking, which is important for wave kind interactions in coastal regions. So the breaker index is a key parameter to estimate the wave energy dissipation due to depth-induced wave breaking. So it was taken as a constant previously, but then was shown to depend on the wave condition and the bottom slope. So in this study, we identify the limitations of six existing schemes for depth induced breaking and uh, under different uh, wave conditions and uh, different, different bot wave, uh, bottom slope as shown in this figure. And based on a series of laboratory and field observations, we, we, we found that actually the break index, uh, it's not a linear function, but it's a nonlinear dependency of uh, break index on the bottom slope in shallow waters. And we, we, then, we then use these different schemes to try to uh, simulate the wave height in shallow waters. And this figure shows the scatter plot of simulated and observed the wave height over different bottom slopes. So you can see the, the new skin indicated by the uh, red line, uh, red marks actually has the Overall, has the best of performance over steep topography and relatively gentle topography, and uh, uh, over the um, reef flat and uh, several field experiments in Lake Slotan. The above mentioned studies are then integrated in this study for the wave count in action, and uh, the best package for the wind input and wave dissipation is T6. And the uh, new schemes for the wing, uh, uh, wave dependent wing stress and depth induced wave breaking are used in a two way coupled wave simulation model. So, this two way mo coupled model is developed to investigate the wave kind of actions during Hurricanes Earl and Eagle in 2010. 
and you can see from this figure the hurricane track and the available uh, observational data for uh, waves and the tides. And uh, you can see here this this table list of the setup of the two two way couple model. A series of numerical experiment was um, performed, including the fully coupled model run and the wave only run, uh, circulation only model run, and the other four runs for different effects of waves on circulation, so as to identify the effect of uh, each process, including the wave dependent wind stress, wave induced bottom stretch, and uh, the wave enhanced mixing, and the three dimensional wave forcing on currents. So we can have a quick look at the fully coupled model results. The top left panel shows the uh, significant wave height, and the top right panel shows the sea surface current and the surface aeration. And you can see larger waves and associated waves uh, generated by the hurricanes and the strong tidal, strong surface currents. And uh, you can also see strong tidal currents in sub-regions such as Gulf Maine, and the lower panels shows the sea surge temperature and the salinity. You can see a surface cooling induced by currents along the hurricane track and the warm water eddies associated with the Gulf Stream. And uh, from the river, uh, from salinity, you can see the real prune in, in the Gulf Lawrence. So we then investigate the effect of wave current in actions on wave variables. This figure shows the time series of observed uh, uh, significant wave height and simulated values in the fully coupled model run, wave only model run. So red marks represent observation, uh, black lines represent a uh, fully coupled model run, and green lines represent wave only run. So the fully, the fully coupled model run reduces the low estimations of uh, uh, peak significant wave height and in the wave only run. And you can see some observed important features are reproduced in the fully coupled model run such as an um, oscillating pattern uh, after, uh, after the peak wind due to the uh, effect of near inertial current. And also the other one is the tidal modulation of uh, wave height in the Gulf Maine and the nearby regions. As shown on the top two panels, you can see the fluctuation uh, which represents the tidal modulation of wave height. As Overall, the fully coupled model run improved model performance by including the wave current in actions. And this is also demonstrated by examining the wave period and the one dimensional and two dimensional wave spectra. So here we, we, had, we have a quick look at the swaths of maximum uh, significant wave height in the fully coupled model run and wave only run. And the relative differences between these two, uh, between these two during these two hurricanes. So the swath map are biased to the right-hand side of the uh, hurricane tracks, and the differences represent the current effects on waves. So which, which can be, which, which shows that the, wave, the maximum wave height can be uh, reduced by more than 10% along the hurricane track close to the hurricane track. And those edits um, can, can can produce the difference by more than 20 percent uh, as because its absolute value is relatively small. So we then have a quick uh, look at the uh, effect of currents, uh, effect of waves on currents. This figure shows a snapshot of surface currents in the fully coupled model run and uh, the the on the top depth panel and then shows the overall wave effect on currents and uh, the effect of wave enhanced wet mixing and the uh, wave induced forcing. So overall the surface currents are reduced and moderated towards the anti-cyclonic um, direction. And the reduction is mainly caused by the wave enhanced wet mixing, but compensated by additional wave, wave, wave forces. So here we can see the uh, uh, important role for the wave induced baroclinic effect on ocean currents and then uh, those 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 different processes maybe uh, could 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 be uh, could compensate each other. So we next investigate the effect of wave currents on the sea level. So this figure shows you you, you um, 
shows you the comparison of the total seawater at four tidal gauge stations. Mm -hmm. the, full, the fully coupled model run indicated the ballot back lines reduce the O estimation of, uh, uh, of the amplitude in the circulation only run, particularly at St. John and Yarmouth. And you can see that the magnitude becomes smaller, uh, which is actually mainly due to the wave induced bottom stress. And also the fully coupled model run increased the peak storm surge uh, in, in, some case, uh, in some cases as indicated by top two panels. So we calculated differences um, at uh, St. John and Yarmouth and the wave induced uh, differences can be up to uh, around uh, 9%. So these two hurricanes caused strong surface cooling and this figure shows you the time series of sea surface temperature at several buoy stations near hurricane tracks in the circulation only run indicated by a green line. So the hurricane induced surface cooling is not intense enough. And, uh, uh, but in comparison in the fully coupled model run indicated by the black lines. So it generally pr uh, produced low values of sea surface temperature and they have better performance for the uh, better agreement with observed variations of the sea surface temperature. And the, the sea surface temperature are further examined by comparing the sea surface cooling estimate from the satellite data and uh, in, in, with different model runs. And you can see there's a stronger surface cooling um, near the Scotia shore. Um, produced in the uh, fully coupled model run, which has a better agreement with the uh, satellite observations. So we then investigate the uh, vertical distribution of temperature along a cross shot section um, along the solution shot where strong cooling happens, indicated by the green line. So the top two panels shows the water temperature before and after hurricane below along the transect the uh, hurricane cause strong surface cooling and reduce the vertical stratification and, uh, with a deeper mixing the depths. So the lower, the lower four panels shows the overall wave effect on the water temperature and then the effects from different processes. So surface waves can greatly reduce the temperature in top to uh, top uh, 25 meters around and uh, the re reduction in water temperature can appear in depths of more than, more than 100 meters. So this is man mainly due to additional wave forcing on currents and the wave enhanced water mix only decreased the water temperature in top 20, uh, top around 20 meters and increased the temperature below. And also the de wave dependent moisture has also contributed to the cooling of, of the up layer. So in summary, we adjust uh, some important scientific questions in the uh, wave counting actions using a wide range of of original data. And uh, the main findings uh, are listed here. So first uh, is the packages for wind input and wave dissipation have different performance under different sea state. And uh, the, the ST6 has the best performance. And then we found that sea surface roughness has different dependencies on the wave age under different sea state. And in shallow waters, the, the break index for depth induced wave breaking has a nonlinear dependency on the bottom slope in shallow waters. So, uh, and in the end, the ocean waves can be significantly affected by uh, different uh, types of currents, including storm induced currents, uh, near inertia current, and uh, tides and large scale circulations. And the dominant process for wave effect on currents differ in different environmental conditions. So more details can be found in our published papers. And I will stop here and uh, take some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanfei, for great talk and for keeping good time. So now it's uh, time for questions and the comments. Let's to Stop sharing first. Okay. If anyone has uh, has any questions. Yeah, are there any questions? Afraid, afraid to do, pa. 
Um, thanks, I'm Fei and, um, and good TV. Uh, quick question is, uh, I know yes. that uh, my colleague Francois Roy uh, um, played with a Verascal formulation for um, the wind stress. And I, I was curious if you, if it, I don't know if it has the same uh, uh, shape that you, you found that uh, you, I was requiring a new test we, where it basically uh, in those bell shape. Uh, which which uh, which formula I uh, um, I share the screen again. Just a moment. So well, yes. Yeah, so I, it's called, it's called the rascal, but I don't really know. <clears throat> I don't remember which shape he has. So, but I was, I think it's uh, different from a large end pond. That's all I know. <laughs> uh, yes, for example, large end pond is indicated by the blue, blue line. Yeah. So some of them they, they do represent the uh, enhanced drug coefficient low range, like like Yellen and Taylor, like this green line. Yeah, but they still they, they still only consider the the drug coefficient, drug coefficient as function of wing. So okay, uh, well our, yeah yeah in okay. our formula, so the wave effect are taken uh, in, are taken taken into account. So. You can see actually when we compare the predicted uh, frictional velocity, they will have uh, 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 higher agreement with uh, observational data. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Using the wave information is always better. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So next, uh, Jing Yi. The... Yeah, something. Uh, yeah, done a very good job. And uh, by summarizing a lot of research results of the five papers. Um, one question, you did discuss the, um, how the effect of the sea ice influence wave currents, um, but you could uh, uh, ex um, mention is that actually the uh, model uses a couple wave circulation model, but the uh, ice just uh, uh, specified. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit more? So, and what yes. kind of future research should be done? Yeah. Yes, because actually we call it one way couple because actually it's based on wave model and we provide the circulation and we provide the uh, ice data. So this ice data is from uh, Canadian ice service. So actually, uh, so to us in for future study, we actually we would like to have a fully uh, two way coupled. Uh, actually, it's not only two way, probably three, two, um, three components, they fully mm -hmm. coupled. One is wave, one is uh, ocean circulation and the other part is uh, sea ice. As we know we have sea ice in high latitude, and and uh, and I know I think Jingyu Jingyu's group is is working on this part towards a big domain in the uh, for the east east coast, uh, including including uh, I think it's uh, from 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 uh, North Scotia or, or even even southern to towards high latitude uh, around. Uh, 70, 75 degree, right? Yeah. 75 degree north. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a, that, that's one, one, uh, one of the, of, uh, of the direction for future study. Yeah, good, excellent. Thank you, Sophie. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Jingyu. Good, yeah. Mm -hmm. I also have a question. So for yes, radiation please. stress in the coupling, do mm -hmm. you use two dimensional or three dimensional radiation stress? Uh, actually, so we we actually we use vortex force formula because in, in several previous study we found that the vortex formula could be better than the radiation stress. Okay. I think okay. one study is done by Pen Chen, uh, Dr. Pen Chen Wan. Okay. Yeah. 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 So for for the influence on the storm surge, I so do you think like from your experience, the vortex is also better parameterization? You know compared with like a radiation stress for, for storm Z? Uh, I didn't do the comparison, but based on the uh, uh, several previous papers, it could be. Actually, the most, uh, uh, the most important uh, difference, I think, is in coastal waters. The radiation stress can generate in some uh, unrealistic uh, currents, undertow currents. Oh, yeah. That's, okay, good. That, 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 that's, could be one of the uh, problem for using radiation stress, but yeah. 
but for myself, I didn't do the comparison. So. Okay, thanks again, Samfi. Thank you. I will stop sharing. Thank you all. Good, okay. Good. Uh, so next presentation is given by uh, Chen Tong Pei, and uh, the topic is a new molecule study of circulation hydrography and the dissolved oxygen over the Scotian Shelf. Pei Tong. Uh, Chen Tong. Oh, oh, wait a second. <coughs> uh, can you see the screen? Yes, we can see. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Albert Pei from the Hosei University with supervisor Professor Shen and the collaborators Dr. Hashi and the PhD student Yi Sui. I will talk about the numerical study on variability of circulation, hydrography, and dissolved oxygen over coastal waters of the Scotian Shelf. The presentation includes the introduction model setup and validation, numerical study on hydrodynamics and dissolved oxygen, and the summary and future work. Many previous studies uh, investigated the hydrodynamical variability over the Scotian shelf. However, the quantification of tidal and wind effects are still limited. There are some scientific questions to be addressed, including the effects of wind and the tidal forcing on hydrography, circulation, and the dissolved oxygen over the southwestern Scotian shelf. The main objective of this study is to investigate the temporal and spatial variability of hydrography, uh, circulation, and the dissolved oxygen caused by wind and the tidal forcing over the southwestern Scotian shelf. The important research tools used in this study include a physical model based on ROMS and the CICE over the Eastern Canadian Shelf and a coupled simple oxygen model over the Southwestern Scotian Shelf. The physical model is a three-level nasty grid circulation ice modeling system developed by Professor Sheng's research group with one-way nesting. Then the model domain external forcing and the initial and the boundary conditions are from public data sets. We apply the spectral nudging and the semi pronounced method to reduce the model errors in large scale circulation and the systematic signal model drift. We couple a simple oxygen model developed by Professor Katia Fano's research group to some model R3 of the physical model. The governing equation and the Newman boundary conditions at the sea surface and sea bottom indicate that dissolved oxygen in the ocean depends on advection and mixing, night water respiration, air sea oxygen flux, and the sediment oxygen consumption. We apply the parameterization of night water respiration based on global reanalysis data and the method from Picard and Chris Tenson. The animation shows the daily mean model results of surface temperature and circulation in August 2018. Parent model results are shown outside the box, and child model results are shown inside the box. Parent models provide dynamically consistent boundary conditions to child models. Uh, this is the comparison between the monthly mean model results of SST and SSS and the monthly mean remote sensing data in March and September 2018. The comparison indicates that the model reproduces reasonably well the large scale monthly mean SST and SSS features in these two months, uh, including the cold and the fresh waters over uh, coastal regions and the warm and the salty waters over deep ocean. 
model also reasonably reproduces the seasonal variability of SST and SSS. We also validate the simulated tidal elevation and tidal currents against the observations and the other published results and uh, find that our model has a satisfactory performance. We compare the coupled dissolved oxygen a concentration model results with the global reanalysis data and the CTD observations. Firstly, let us see the top feature. The middle and the red panels show the simulated and the reanalysis dissolved oxygen at the sea surface under 70 meters. The comparison demonstrates that our model results are comparable with the reanalysis data. The figure at the bottom shows the comparison between instantaneous observations in red dots and the daily mean simulated dissolved oxygen concentration in blue dots at points B, C, and D shown in the bottom red panel. As we can see, the coupled circulation ice, uh, uh, the coupled circulation oxygen model has a satisfactory scales to simulate the general vertical structure of dissolved oxygen. Uh, to investigate the effects of wind and the tides on hydrography and circulation, we conduct a full numerical experiment, including control run, which is a realistic run. No wind with winds turn off in some models L2 and L3. No L3 wind with local winds turn off in some model L3. And no tide without tidal forcing. In particular, we analyzed the model results in August 2018. We compare the August mean L3 uh, model results from control run and no L3 wind to investigate the effects of local winds. Local winds induce a coastal upwellings in August 2018, as shown by the strip of cold SSTs near the coast in Fissure A. Local winds also significantly reduce the August mean SSTs through wind induced vertical mixing. The wind-induced currents modify eddies and meanders and thus modify temperature and salinity distributions and the density-driven currents in R3 domain. This is a similar comparison as before, except for between cases no R3 wind and no wind. The comparison demonstrates that remote winds generate shelf waves and thus modify ocean circulation in some model R3. The modulation of currents over the R3 domain results in modifications of hydrography and the density driven currents. We also compare the temperature and salinity profiles in three cases along Transider PP prime, which is normal to the coastline at Liverpool Bay, as shown in Figure G. From the comparison, we can see that local winds induce coastal upwelling in August 2018 as shown by the upward tilted temperature contours in Fissure A. The vertical mixing induced by local winds significantly affect the hydrographic vertical stratification in the top 15 meters. Local winds also play very important roles in local thermal stratification as shown by the significant difference between figure A and B. Remote winds affect the horizontal advection at the intermediate and the bottom layers and thus modify temperature and the salinity distributions below 30 meters. This is the August mean temperature and salinity differences between cases control run and no tide at a surface and 40 meters of the R2 domain, which indicates the tidal effects over the region. Strong tides significantly affect the hydrography and the circulation over the Bay of Fendi, Jory's Bank, and the coastal waters of Yarmouth in summer months through tide induced vertical mixing, uh, tidal rectification, and the modulation of density driven currents. Tidal forcing also modifies a large scale ocean current, including the Gulf Stream and the Labrador Current, and the outer Ides meanders and the frontal structures over the slope water region. 
To analyze the effects of strong tides, we compare temperature and salinity model results from cases control run and no tide on transit EE prime. The comparison shows that the strong tidal forcing significantly reduced the vertical stratification of temperature and salinity along transect EE prime through strong tidal mixing and tidal rectification. In particular, the strong tides significantly reduce SST and increase subsurface temperature below 40 meters over offshore waters below 40 kilometers from the coast along transect EE prime in August 2018. Similarly, a strong tides also affect the salinity stratification. We, we also implemented the control run, no air three wind, and no tide using the coupled simple oxygen model. In case control run, seasonal warming of upper column water leads to negative surface oxygen flux. Because of seasonal warming, a surface mixer layer loses a significant dissolved oxygen to the atmosphere. During a summer months, the, the vertical stratification is strong and the vertical mixing is weak. Uh, therefore, subsurface water between 20 and 40 meters in trips uh, high dissolved oxygen in summer. In case no air three wind, there is no air sea oxygen flux. The high dissolved oxygen from winter is tripped in the upper water column in no air three wind, resulting in unrealistically high and oversaturated dissolved oxygen in the upper column. Also, the absence of wind induced mixing contributes to the large dissolved oxygen horizontal gradient. Uh, this slide compares the, the August mean model results from control run and no tide. Tides affect uh, the vertical uh, gradients uh, through tide induced vertical mixing and uh, thus reduce uh, the, the dissolved oxygen maxima between 20 and 40 meters in summer months. Strong tidal forcing also result in relatively low dissolved oxygen at 20 meters to the south of Cape Sabo Island. In addition, uh, tide induced uh, modulation of uh, horizontal transport affects uh, uh, dissolved oxygen concentration, particularly over the northeast uh, portion of the R3 domain. Summary, uh, both winds and tides affect uh, coastal circulation and enhance the vertical mixing. Wind induced, a uh, uh, wind affect uh, her wind affect uh, hydrography and the dissolved oxygen concentration in upper water columns through IRC oxygen flux and the vertical mixing. Tide induced vertical mixing reduce the vertical stratification and thus affect uh, the values of DO um, maxima in the vertical caused by uh, seasonal warming and stratification during the summer. The future work includes the investigation on hydrodynamical connectivity and the ocean response to extreme weather. And that's all my presentation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chen Tong. And uh, do I have any question for Chen Tong? Oh, great. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, we will proceed uh, uh, to the next. Uh, so next speaker is Fred Dupam, and uh, he's going to talk about overview of the change to the Canadian water cycle prediction system. Fred? Okay, sorry guys, I forgot to uh, switch on my mute, my mic and, and video before uh, sharing my screen. I'll try again now. 
Um, uh, yeah, I can see now. Yeah, and do you see my uh, my presentation? Yes, but it's not in the presentation mode yet. It's a, it's. A... Yeah, what's going on here? Uh, okay, do you see it now? Yeah, now it's good. Ah, okay, good. Oof, <laughs> it's working finally. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you. Um, uh, to give you an update of uh, the water prediction system, uh, water cycle prediction system we run at uh, at uh, what is called now CC map um, and but used to be CMC. So uh, CC map uh, stand for Clim uh, Center uh, Canadian Center for Meteorology and Rental Predictions, and uh, CMC used to be just for meteorology. So you see the uh, importance of environment uh, has been added to to the name, and you have the name also of all, all my collaborators. And uh, so, um, so moving to the next one, what happened? Oh, okay, that works this way. Okay, the, um, so first I'm going to show you the, uh, the cascade of uh, uh, ocean uh, prediction system we run at, uh, at CC map. So you have the global the quarter degree GOPS. Uh, that's a uh, pilot at the boundary, the, uh, the original uh, uh, ice uh, ocean configuration called REOP, so the 12 degree, and itself that feeds into the, um, the 36 uh, uh, degree uh, CIOPS west on the west coast and CIOPS east on the east coast of Canada. And, and the systems I'm going to mention here, uh, uh, the one I highlighted inside the, uh, uh, the red circle, that the Great Lake at two kilometer, and the Gulf system five kilometers that used to be run until last year. So water cycle prediction system is, uh, oh, I forgot to mention one thing, go back. Yeah, the, the top row is actually all the system coupled um, in two ways to the atmosphere. So, and the atmosphere model at, uh, at CC map is, is called JAM for, for those who are not, not, not aware. So uh, JAM is, is stand for global environmental uh, uh, model, I guess. Uh, the um, uh, so go back, yeah. So all the uh, the couple configuration I, I just uh, named Gem Nemo in general. So if you, if you hear me that saying that, that's a, that's a couple configuration. So we have uh, a couple configuration of um, uh, the Gem Nemo uh, run uh, over the uh, over uh, uh, Canada, so Great Lakes in the uh, in the past. And this one was to, uh, then, uh, then the precipitation uh, is uh, taken out from, from the Gem Nemo is used to drive uh, a hydrology model over the, um, uh, the, the Gulf uh, uh, of San Ramon and the, uh, the Great Lakes and San Ramon River. So over the Gulf San Ramon is actually not fitting back into any ocean model at this stage. So this is still to be done. And the, um, and this one uh, fits back into Nemo um, uh, over the Great Lakes only. So that actually shows you the new uh, uh, system that I'm, yeah, after the update. But the Gulf system and the Great Lakes system uh, 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 last year were pretty much the same, except for the Gulf of uh, uh, Saint domain didn't exist for the hydrology. The, uh, so the, the issue was the, uh, with the old systems uh, for the Great Lakes and the Gulf there was that they, uh, they were get, uh, getting pretty much uh, uh, deprecated in terms of uh, code version for uh, Nemo and Jam. And, um, and uh, also for the Gulf system, the, uh, if I go back, uh, the Gulf system, it was, it, um, it was duplicating effort since we were running CIOPS East. I was also covering the, the Gulf uh, of St. Lawrence region, except at 36 degrees, about equivalent to two kilometers. And uh, this one was used to be five. So, uh, and the other issues also is that the, uh, the, the, the Nemo 3.1 version using both uh, of these uh, systems um, uh, was uh, was not using a, any um, atmospheric pressure gradient, so uh, it's which is important for storm surge prediction. So the Great Lakes not so important because of uh, the size uh, of the lakes are small enough, but the pressure gradient difference across the lake is not that important. But the, uh, for golf, it was it was making quite a quite a, a difference. So so uh, pushing for uh, for getting a, a storm surge prediction system out of those yeah, really requested that we 
we switch uh, Nemo version and um, and um, and improve also the, uh, the domain configuration. So uh, as I mentioned, the, um, this is important for water level. The, uh, this is used for emergency response, uh, search and rescue. Uh, the Canadian ice service is, is using that for the sea ice forecast or the ice, uh, sea ice outlook, as we call that. And also uh, the, uh, the correct system was used for coordinating program with, uh, with the US. Uh, so the, uh, the new configuration for uh, Great Lakes, oh yeah, and the, uh, the uh, well, I mentioned also to, I forgot to mention that the, uh, the older uh, two kilometer version for the Great Lakes uh, suffered from a, a grid shift uh, that some users found, uh, found uh, difficult to live with. So we decided to basically create a new configuration for at one kilometer for uh, the Great Lakes. And uh, we use that so, uh, for what we call pseudo analysis. So it's, uh, so some kind of a handcast we, uh, we do just before forecast. Um, and for forecast, we decided to actually merge that configuration of our Great Lakes with uh, the CEOPS um, configuration, CEOPS's domain. So we have much bigger uh, domain, um, uh, but now we can, uh, we can couple that to the atmosphere. So we had to um, create a new configuration for atmosphere. I'm not going to, to mention that too, uh, uh, in too much details, but uh, the, uh, the older uh, configuration for Jam was uh, was quite overlapping of each other, so definitely there was a, a need to uh, rationalize that. And uh, so, using uh, a new Jam configuration, which is the the one in the background blue, which uh, extends from the almost the Rockies to uh, well into the North Atlantic, was the best option for us. And that covers the sea ops domain as well. Uh, we did some tests to uh, check the uh, the new version was not uh, degrading anything in terms of uh, sea ice. As you, so red is the new, uh, blue is the old, um, uh, and black is the observation of the different lakes and the uh, NSST. Uh, actually, the uh, between Nemo 31 and 36, um, if I forgot to mention Nemo 36, the new version of a code that is used in the, the system, it's actually now. The, the, whole, uh, the same version uh, in all the operational system uh, run now. And uh, waiting for Nemo 4, uh, I guess, in uh, maybe in a couple of years. But we still have uh, the same issues, which is that uh, overestimate of uh, sea surface temperature or lake temperature, I guess, in that case, for, for Lake Superior. The other, the other lakes are not so bad, but this one is really stands out. Uh, and it's probably an issue because it's uh, it's a very icy during winter, and uh, and you get uh, below zero degree. Uh, sorry, oh, uh, yeah, you get close to zero degree, but the uh, the maximum density for fresh water is four degrees. So there's internal internal uh, well interesting anyway physics going on in terms of convection, and that's probably explain why we have so much issue here. Uh, but well, the new version uh, wasn't intended to improve that, and we're just happy that it doesn't degrade anymore. Uh, so the big, uh, the big surprise was actually uh, came out to be water level. So um, what we found out is that the, uh, uh, we we did a switch to to, uh, to uh, the new three six in blue, uh, but uh, on the the previous configuration two kilometer, and uh, we found uh, a quite surprising dip in water level for Lake Superior. Actually, you can see it a little more uh, Lake Erie. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's much weaker in the other lake. So Lake Erie Super really stands out the deep, and then the recovery after, and it's uh, after the ice season. So it's really related to, to the ice, and I'm going to explain that in more detail. And the red is the new after correction. So I'm going to explain that again. The um, the uh, so the issue is that Nemo three six, and uh, we found out uh, a bit by uh, by. Uh, Testing an error. The, uh, uh, in in Nemo three one, I guess uh, we use uh, a uh, uh, levitating ice model with a virtual self flux. So basically, any uh, mass exchange between uh, the ice and the water was not represented in uh, in terms of uh, loss of volume in uh, in the water compartment. But it is in Nemo three six. Um, and especially, uh, we we didn't have any way around because uh, 
uh, as soon as you want to have uh, tides, you need the nonlinear free surface, and then you need the uh, this uh, this mass exchange. Somehow, it's uh, it's it's part of an emo free six. There's no way around that. So what it means is that is ice is formed. Uh, the water below that ice formation uh, depresses. Uh, so following the volume of water remaining in that box, if you like, and 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 uh, the ice is growing on top, and um, and uh, that explains why we see this big dip in uh, in water. It's uh, it's when the ice forms, the, vo the the volume of water reduces basically. Uh, it's not quite what, what uh, a measurement will give you, and that's the. Uh, and uh, that's uh, that was a surprise. The, uh, I mean, if you basically a water level is equivalent of drilling a hole through the ice and measuring the water after it equilibrates inside the hole. So it will be basically at the same level as the outside the, uh, the ice. So that's what you measure. And uh, and uh, we um, uh, so to represent the effect of the ice um, uh, displacing water. Uh, uh, the Archimedes principle, we had to add an, another option, which is the, uh, the ice loading. Uh, so, and add also the ice loading to the SSH so, so that we, we can compare to actual, actual water level measured. And I'm going to go over that. So the, um, the other surprise is that uh, once we ice the ice loading on, it was working perfectly. That's the red line I was showing before. Uh, the uh, the only issue is that okay let's, yeah was that the um, we had some plug of ice between the lakes because the currents are much faster uh, in the channels con connecting the lakes and that was because the volume of water now is reduced in this uh, is this setup that can actually create an instability and uh, uh, up to a point where the minimal crash because the water uh, goes to volume of water goes to zero in that plug of ice. Uh, so to uh, to alleviate these issues, we just decided to assimilate bogus data, that is artificial uh, data where we set concentration to uh, to zero, uh, ice concentration to zero. Uh, that's the way we are, we're running now. Um, so the the lake, the, uh, once everything was done, we uh, the ice um, uh, prediction was much better. That's the red line you're showing here compared to the blue in terms of virus. I'm going to show that. But, and the, uh, the, ice cap uh, the ice prediction capacity was also shown here for that uh, particular case where we see the ice uh, detaching from the soft shore in the lake area uh, as, and, and predicted by the model correctly. So uh, to finalize that uh, discussion, we, uh, oh yeah, we had also a discussion with a hydrologist about what was going on in, uh, in, in uh, the effect of coupling on the precipitation and, um, and evaporation. And it sounds like it's, it was basically the coupling uh, Aspect of that was um, was that the uh, the, the actual um, uh, regional uh, deterministic prediction system system atmospheric model used in, uh, 10 kilometer in operations was uh, was using persistence for uh, for sea ice and SST so it was actually degrading uh, the uh, evaporation and uh, and, uh, and precipitation because of that essentially. So the conclusion we, is that we, uh, we found the ice loading to be quite important over Great Lakes. Uh, we had very little time to do all the development work to, uh, to make it operation that we, uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, bumps. We hit a lot of bumps during that time. But everything is running now and uh, it's coupled. Uh, it's equivalent of CIOPS on the NIST domain. It goes a little uh, longer in terms of uh, lead time. Uh, um, uh, that is, uh, it's three days and a half instead of two days. But it's not driven by the high resolution winds that we have over sea up. So we still have to figure what's the best. Uh, that's it. And that's where the two links I have for, uh, for the, uh, the publication of the Great Lakes or the, um, and the sea ops. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred, for providing this uh, update. Um, questions or comments for Fred? Uh, Jing Yu. Yeah, I'm afraid of quite a nice talk and I really like to see the couple model working for Great Lakes. I have a question. Um, so um, look at the Tom Sears ice cover in the um, Great Lakes and actually a very good job. And uh, did you look at, um, for example, um, 
the estuary of Salonga River and also middle of the Gulf of Salonga Sea. The winter uh, models have a very good performance. So um, I didn't explain that. I was actually part yeah. of this uh, this slide. So over the uh, the Gulf, that's a. Yes. a the plot on the right was also yes. improving the, the sea ice projection against the, uh, the old model. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are, there is a trick also to that. It, we, that is that we initialize, so at R0 forecast, we initialize using uh, the same thing we, which is used in REOPS, the regional ice uh, prediction system. That is, we use um, a 3 var analysis of uh, ice concentration uh, at five kilometer uh, resolution around, around uh, uh, Canada. And that improves actually a lot the, uh, the, the prediction. So it's a bit of a, it doesn't really say if the model yeah. is better, because, but, but we, we made sure so, that the prediction was actually better. Yeah. So, so how often you use uh, CIS uh, reanalysis? Like uh, this is a forecast model, isn't it? Is this forecast model or forecast? A, yeah, the forecast model is run four times a day. Yes. And uh, zero Z, you have zero UTC, six, 12, and 18. and and we have a 3D VAR analysis, uh, so a data simulation system for ice concentration uh, for, for four instances. So we can I start see. on the, the mm -hmm. actual analysis each time. I see, good. Uh, thank you, thank you, Fred. Okay, thanks, uh, Fred. So now, uh, the next speaker is uh, Celine Gagan and talking about where terrestrial carbon goes when it mixed with the coastal waters. Thank you. Uh, can you see the screen? Uh, no, not yet. Okay, nice. Is that working now? No, not yet. Maybe in the lower middle, can, can, like, can you see like a green thing, like it's a share screen? Yep, it's what oh. I have on my okay. screen. Yeah, is it, is it okay for, for you now? No, still no. not sure. No, not, not yet, you need to share the screen. Yeah, it's you, what you I did. Yeah, to, uh, did, yeah, yeah uh, work on, work on. Yeah, yeah it's yes. coming. Okay, good, yeah. Coming? Yeah. It's on the speaker mode too? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so we're gonna switch gear a bit because uh, my talk is not on, on uh, physical modeling per se. We're using chemical traces to see how model works and performs, and uh, we do that in uh, Hudson Bay uh, for today. So this, uh, this talk uh, title is where terrestrial carbon goes when it, it mixes with coastal waters. Uh, and uh, my collaborators are here from University of Sherbrooke as well as University of Manitoba, uh, Dr. Zuzu Kuzik and her student. Uh, this talk is a contribution of a basis program that is led by uh, late uh, David Barber. And uh, we're also using data collected in, uh, through Arctic Vet grants. Uh, so that's a, a combination of all those uh, programs here. Oops, long screen, this one. Okay, Hudson Bay, uh, as, you, as you probably know, is a, is a shallow and inland sea with two main sources of freshwater, sea ice melt and, and uh, river discharge. So we are more mainly interested in the, la in the last one, uh, river discharge, and uh, as uh, you show, as is shown here on the chart on the map, uh, there are different uh, villages that uh, at the mouth of uh, various rivers. So all those rivers uh, flows into Hudson Bay, which is uh, fairly unusual uh, in the world. So uh, recently in 2019, Stadnik and Etal have uh, predicted that the river discharge into Hudson Bay will increase over the next 40 years. So that's uh, that's uh, something that we have to keep in mind. Um, also, Hudson Bay is uh, surrounded by permafrost, and, and that permafrost is, uh, is, in, is not in very good shape nowadays because of uh, climate change. Uh, the thawing will bring more carbon to, to rivers and eventually to the, uh, to, uh, to the bay. 
itself. Uh, and in 2013, Steiner et al. Uh, showed that uh, the bay has already increased by 0.48 degrees Celsius per decade, and that rate will even increase over time and close to a, um, a 0.94 uh, degree per decade for the next 40, 40, 50 years. So all of that together means that the, the bay is uh, is uh, very sensitive to, to changes and in particular to freshwater discharge. Um, also, uh, the previous work were based on a very limited data set like shown here by Grant Scarg et al with all those uh, tiny dots that you see on the left hand side map. Uh, each dot represents a data point. And in that work, uh, they show the uh, freshwater inventory based on oxygen 18, and it, it was a fairly, uh, fairly large amount of fresh water that sits on the top of seawater in the bay, up to 10 meters in the uh, southeastern south end uh, of the bay. Uh, on the right hand side, it, they differentiated the river uh, water from the sea ice melt. So river freshwater is in black and uh, sea ice melt is in, in the, the white bar. Um, and they indicate that uh, James Bay, which is a southernmost tip of the bay, it would be a large contributor of uh, freshwater to uh, Hudson Bay itself, but that it's based just on, on a couple of points. So our project here is to, to first of all, increase the number of observation in the bay and see where that, uh, that uh, river water goes based on tracers like uh, carbon. So in this slide here, I, shows, uh, I show all the data points that we have collected over uh, nine years from 20, 2009 to 2018, a uh, total of over a thousand sample, discrete samples collected uh, from, uh, collected out of uh, the Amundsen or uh, De Crozier uh, icebreakers from the Coast Guard. Um, and again, that's part of a basis program in ArcticNet. So with that array of samples, we covered a large range, uh, the, pretty much the whole Hudson Bay. All the samples were collected in summertime, spring, summertime. Uh, we have very few samples in winter. Uh, but that it's a common issue in all uh, observations in, uh, in the Arctic. Uh, so first of all, we wanted to see where the carbon come goes uh, when it leaves the river to uh, and, and reach, to, uh, reach the, the coastal regions. So as expected, we saw a decrease in, in carbon uh, from the river mass, so low salinity to high salinity, which is the average salinity in the coastal region in Hudson Bay, around 25, 26. Um, in winter and in summer, winter is in black and summer is in red. And two estuaries, the Nelson River on western Hudson Bay and Great Whale River on southeast Hudson Bay, the main, the major rivers uh, of uh, Hudson Bay. For both system, they follow a conservative mixing. So that means that physical uh, dilution is at play here. Um, and mainly in summer, there's some, um, some discrepancy in winter, but I, I won't get into details of that here. So here, what that means that it's, we have uh, the carbon that is, uh, that's living the, the river and reaching the, the bay uh, is slowly diluted uh, with uh, coastal seawater. But then what's happened to that carbon? That's a, that's a question that we wanted to address here. So when we look at all the, the data that we have over the bay, we find that all the data points that were uh, considered as coastal waters or coastal sites means that the depth less than 100 meters. Uh, um, I had a much higher concentration in carbon than the samples that were considered as marine system. Uh, so that also was expected. There is actually a 13 uh, fold difference between coastal and marine system. And all that carbon basically stays within the, the 100 meter uh, either, either, uh, either depths uh, or either line and don't really go across from the coast to the bay. Uh, that follows, that is in agreement with the can do it uh, concept that Grant Scott um, uh, proposed a couple of years ago. But 
so that's uh, coastal versus marine. But now if we look at in, in uh, details, different regions within the bay, here it's what we have. Uh, the first bar here is Fox Basin. So Fox Basin, we have the very top here and the Fox Basin concentration, if we look at the mean here, it's not significant and different from the marine system, uh, the marine sites within the bay itself. So what that means is that means that the, the carbon that is coming out of uh, the Arctic Ocean um, and finding its way to uh, the Atlantic Ocean is very similar to the carbon that we see in the uh, offshore domain of Hudson Bay. Now, James Bay itself, which I said earlier, that was a, a site that, or a region that was uh, poorly investigated in, in the past, we found a drastic difference between Western uh, James Bay and Eastern James Bay, with Eastern James Bay um, having a lot more carbon than Western James Bay. Uh, that makes total sense because of what Eastern James Bay, we have larger rivers than on Western James Bay. Uh, and the, the differentiation between uh, the uh, inflow and outflow uh, also exists in Hudson Strait. As you probably know, in Hudson Strait, we have, it's a two direction uh, strait. Uh, the Northern uh, passe, Passage is, uh, is uh, the inflow from, uh, uh, <clears throat> from uh, Labrador Sea Baffin Bay uh, to, to the strait itself. <clears throat> Whereas uh, the southern uh, region is the outflow of Atom Bay, which is enriched in carbon as, uh, because it, it carries the carbon that coming from James Bay in, in uh, Hudson Bay um, by itself. So then we wanted to, to see, to know more about that carbon, what kind of carbon we have. So not to, uh, to go into much detail, see on how we did that. So we have, uh, our 1,063 different samples. And then we ran the model onto that to differentiate the different constituent of that carbon. And we found three different uh, terrestrial type of carbon here, C1, 2, and 3. Uh, one uh, more marine carbon, and the last one more <clears throat> uh, phytoplankton based carbon. <coughs> Excuse me. So, <coughs> At the James Bay Gate, so we had uh, <clears throat> we were lucky to have uh, two um, two transect. Excuse me. Um, the first one goes uh, um, from West James Bay to East James Bay, just across the bay itself, and we have a second transect uh, 15, 60 kilometers uh, further north. And so we had data point at each of those, uh, of those sites here. So looking at uh, the salinity contour plot on the, on the right hand side here. So the, the warmer color uh, um, illustrate the, the um, salty waters and the, the cooler colors in blue, uh, purple and so on, um, uh, fresher water. So what you can uh, easily see here is we have a hot uh, as part of, of very fresh waters here at the tip of uh, Eastern James Bay, right there, right at the tip of Eastern James Bay. That is uh, more likely due to the flow of uh, uh, fresh water from uh, Southern James Bay um, that carries a lot of carbon out of the bay. So when we look at then the carbon itself, so either the absorbance carbon or the fluorescence carbon on the right hand side, we saw exactly the same trends, um, uh, meaning that we have a hotspot right at the tip of Eastern James Bay, both using absorbance or fluorescence. And that carbon that is coming out of here um, is exactly the same that is at the river mouth of, uh, of Lagrande. So what that means in terms of circulation is that uh, very rich carbon waters here are flowing out of James Bay and then uh, they don't go to JB15 here. Uh, only a slight portion of it goes that way. Most of it goes straight up northward. So if we were to put areas of fresh water on that transect, we'll have uh, the majority of fresh water living out of James Bay and flowing northward with the, a, a small fraction, uh, like 
going around the, uh, the coast along the Can uh, Quebec course, coast. Whereas the inflow into James Bay uh, follows the, the Ontario coast. So that pattern, that uh, surface flow patterns, uh, is in, in fairly good agreement with, uh, with a modeling work run by uh, Myers Group, published in, in 2019. Uh, that is, is based on satellite altimetry data and model uh, output. Um, I won't be able to speak much about that model um, here, but uh, what I, I wanted to, to say is uh, what they found is the fact that uh, the James Bay, Alt, James Bay waters uh, leave the bay uh, on the right hand side of the bay, and then one portion goes around Belshaz Island and another portion goes up here, um, straight northward. Um, based on our carbon data, we, we can uh, say that the majority of the James Bay flow goes northward and only a fraction goes along the coast here, hugging uh, the Quebec uh, coast. So that's, we, we found a, a pretty good agreement with carbon, and we also have supporting data based on barium that shows exactly the same. So to summarize what we have here in terms of uh, terrestrial carbon, when it, where it goes, when it when is uh, it leaves a, a reef, when it leaves a river, um, so we have coastal carbon or river carbon that re remains on the coast, follow the the uh, uh, 100 meter isoline, and we also have James Bay waters that uh, that leaves James Bay from the eastern side, uh, northward and follow the coast and then is found um, also um, in, in uh, Southern Hudson Street. So that's again is in, in, is in full agreement with, uh, with modeling work and uh, physical oceanography. So in summary, uh, we have uh, so far the larger database of uh, organic matter in the Hudson Bay. Uh, the, there was a, a 13 fold difference in DOM between the coastal and marine regions which is in, in agreement with uh, the conduit concept with very little um, uh, mixing between coastal waters and marine regions, at least in summer. And uh, the last comment is uh, James Bay outflow passes west of uh, the Belshaz Island, uh, northward flow in support of uh, NEMO model uh, simulations. So uh, with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, the time is up, but we can have one quick question. Any question? Okay, so maybe I have a quick one. Is it just, uh, um, do we expect that this pattern will change as the climate changes? Because you mentioned there another river runoff is going to increase as climate change, but will circulation pattern be changing then affect the fate of this uh, uh, carbon? That, that, that's that's a, a very good question. Uh, actually, uh, Myers, Myers group uh, found a difference between the winter and, and uh, spring, summer um, seasons. So that there is a seasonal effect here on the circulation itself. So very likely that there would be a difference also, uh, but uh, we have very little data in, in winter, in real winter to, to support that. Uh, but uh, based on, on the amount of carbon that is living, that, that the, the rivers can carry, uh, that would uh, impact uh, for sure the coastal regions. Uh, as for marine system, it's hard to tell yet in Hudson Bay. In uh, Canada Basin, yes, that's uh, that has been shown already. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks so much. Okay, thank you very much. And Fred, yeah, I saw your uh, question, but in terms of time, maybe we'll go forward. And can you put the, your question into the chat and uh, and the link to you know answer your question? Okay, thanks. Sure. And uh, the next presentation is given by Pascal Met and. Uh, the topic is a framework uh, for estimating river and estuary uh, river tides and estuary discharges from the SWAT satellite mission. 
Pascal. Hi, thank you, uh, Gochi. Do you uh, see my screen? Yes, I can see. And it's already yeah. in presentation mode. Okay. All right. So, um, hi everybody. So, uh, like you, like Gochi said, uh, I'll be presenting a new new framework for estimating uh, tides and, and tidal discharges um, uh, based on the uh, surface water and ocean topography satellite uh, mission. So, I'll give a bit of a context and motivation. Um, talk about the SWAT uh, mission uh, in uh, more detail, and then present the new framework um, that I developed. Uh, focus on the methodology uh, and also applications uh, to the St. Lawrence uh, Fluvial Estuary. And then I'll summarize and, and talk about future work. So first of all, the context and motivation for this work. Um, so, so remote sensing of river discharge uh, in general has been a trend for innovative research in the past decades. Um, and with the forthcoming uh, SWAT mission, uh, there are new possibilities uh, in expanding the global measurements to much smaller rivers because uh, SWAT will see uh, those rivers at a much higher resolution, and many of which are currently engaged. Um, monitoring discharge from rivers to the oceans is, is also critical to understand the stream uh, processes. Uh, however, in tidal rivers and estuaries, um, the, the estimation of discharge itself remains a challenge uh, because it is influenced both by tidal and river influences. It has reversing flows, so the, the steady state um, uh, standard uh, rating curve don't apply. Um, also, the high, there's high te spatial temporal variability compared to the, the relatively sparse uh, remote sensing products uh, available. And their literature on that topic for tidal rivers is very scarce. Uh, so, so there's uh, several methodological challenges that I will be uh, uh, presenting some some of them uh, and addressing in the method uh, I'm I'm uh, presenting. So, first of all, the SWAT mission. So it's a, um, a mission, a partnership between NASA, CNES, uh, CSA, and UKSA. Uh, it has a core payload. Uh, it's a a band radar interferometer with a JSON fast altimeter um, at the, the nadir. Uh, it will see, uh, it will have uh, two uh, 50 kilometers swath on each side of, of nadir, um, measuring uh, water levels uh, and water extent at very um, high resolution. Uh, so I'll focus uh, on the, the land products or the river products. Uh, so uh, the, the requirements for, for those uh, high rate products uh, will be to, to produce a water mass able to resolve uh, uh, 100 meter wide rivers um, with a water level accuracy of about 10 centimeter and a slope accuracy of 1.7 centimeter per kilometer. Um, so the, the SWAT uh, mission uh, will have two different orbits. A first orbit, the fast sampling orbit, that will uh, only last for three months for calibration and validation. And then it will uh, pass to the science orbit, which uh, uh, will last for three years. And this orbit has uh, a repeat cycle of about 21 days. So here's an example of the rivers that uh, will be seen uh, by SWAT uh, globally. Uh, so for each of those river reaches that you see in colors, um, SWAT will provide observations or estimations of the river elevation, uh, river width, uh, slope, and uh, discharge for all rivers uh, wider than 50 to 100 meters. These are the number of uh, passes uh, per 21 day cycle. Um, so at our latitudes here in Canada, we'll have about uh, three to four passes of the satellite uh, per 21 day uh, cycle. So it's about uh, one observation, one SWAT observation per week, approximately. Uh, and the river products are uh, based on uh, a global prior river database uh, called the SWORD. It's a SWAT river database that contains information about the topology of, uh, of the geometry of the rivers, for example. So it's uh, divided into uh, several reaches. Each reach has about uh, a 10 kilometer uh, length, uh, approximately on average, and uh, is composed of several nodes, uh, each of which are separated by about 200 meters. And each uh, node and reach will gather uh, um, information, uh, take um, aggregate information from the pixel cloud 
to the, those uh, node and reaches um, information about, uh, well, first the geometry, but also uh, SWOT observations of, of the water levels. And also uh, it will host the different products um, uh, produced by, by SWOT, for example, the discharge at the reach uh, level. So I'm using this, uh, so this is how uh, uh, this database looks like uh, over the St. Lawrence uh, fluvial estuary. So the, the white uh, line here is the, are the reaches that I will be using in the application I'll show. Uh, this is about a 300 kilometer long uh, river stretch uh, composed of 37 uh, reaches and about uh, 1,700 nodes. Um, from the SWORD database. Um, so I created a sample data, data set uh, to produce uh, SWOT variables. Um, uh, so those variables are the water surface elevations, wetted surface areas, river widths, surface slopes, and tidal discharge spanning three years uh, from 2007 to uh, 2009 inclusively, uh, which uh, present very low water levels and very high uh, water levels, uh, as well as uh, validation data in 2009 where we did a field campaign. So uh, this is a new framework I'm uh, presenting for uh, tidal rivers and estuaries, uh, estuaries to produce tides uh, and, and discharge. So the objective here is to develop a uh, discharge algorithm that are uh, adapted to uh, tidal rivers and estuaries, mm -hmm. um, which are different from uh, the, the official algorithms uh, for discharge uh, for the SWAT mission. Um, so we're building uh, on Confluence, uh, which is uh, the official SWAT platform for uh, discharge production. And we also include the tide reconstructions that account for uh, river flow effects, as well as uh, unsteady uh, discharge computations. So basically the, the package here uh, takes input data. So there's an input processor that uh, feeds a, a tide estimator component and then we do some river uh, variable interpolations, and then uh, we pass the, those variables to uh, the discharge module, uh, where we have two different methods estimating discharge. And then there's an output processor here. So for the, this talk, I'll be only focusing on, on the core uh, three uh, components here. So the first one is the tide estimator. Um, so what is challenging here is that uh, we're dealing with temporally sparse records. So this typically leads to uh, ill-posed inverse problems in the regression in the regression uh, framework. Um, we also have uh, non-linear non coupling of tides with river flow and friction in shallow water that requires uh, typically a larger tidal spectrum to be resolved. Uh, so here um, to uh, extract tidal information from uh, those signals in rivers, uh, we use a modified version of the NSI model, which is uh, which performs non-stationary harmonic analysis. Uh, so basically, we represent the water levels as a function of uh, cosine and sine terms. So this is the, the typical uh, harmonic model. Uh, but the model coefficients are uh, represented as a function of, uh, of discharge, a river uh, discharge. Um, uh, so basically, these uh, coefficients are uh, time varying so that we can have amplitudes and phases that are also a function of time and, and, and discharge. Uh, several adaptations are uh, required to extract tides from uh, SWAT data. Uh, so we, we need to limit the number of tidal constituents, uh, and we do that by using information on tidal energy that is contained in the raw signal. We also uh, have to penalize the constituents or the size of the parameters um, using regular uh, regularization techniques. Uh, here we basically minimize both the uh, residual uh, and the size of the uh, coefficients. And we have a tuning parameter here, uh, lambda, which is uh, determined uh, based on the criterion called the L-curve criterion um, that, that we uh, optimize um, using block cross validation. So here's an example for the St. Lawrence application uh, where we assume no error in upstream discharge and no error in SWAT water levels. Uh, so we just wanna see how well we can uh, reconstruct the tides only based on SWAT-like observations. So the NSI reconstructions uh, are using 14 or less tidal constituents, which is not much, but still uh, and enough to, to capture most of the variability. So this is what we see here. For uh, we're looking at two locations within the 
the St. Lawrence, so a downstream location that, that is mostly dominated by tidal influence, and then an upstream station where you see the influence of the river discharge on the, reducing the, the tidal amplitudes, uh, but also uh, leading to fluctuations in, in the mean water levels. Um, in red, you see the SWAT light observations, and, and then there's a zoom in uh, for a, about one month. Uh, um, uh, where you see how uh, in yellow the, the NS tide is predicting the water levels um, based on parameters that were obtained from the full three years of SWAT data. So this is quite good for the downstream location. Uh, well, good, good enough for the upstream location. It's not perfect, but it's still capturing the, the, the mean water level variability and the tidal uh, variability as well. This is the prediction statistics, so RMSC and, and NASH uh, efficiency coefficient for all station, all reaches that were considered um, in the domain. Now, the second component is the river variable interpolator. Um, so the challenge here is to uh, be able to temporarily and spatially uh, generate continuous river variables that are required for tidal discharge estimations using only sparse uh, data from, uh, from SWAT. So what we do here is that uh, we produce uh, already water levels uh, reconstructed from NSTI, like I just showed a slide ago. Um, and then we, uh, we define from this water levels, we compute the surface slopes uh, using three adjacent uh, reaches from uh, the ground interpolations. Uh, we also linearly interpolate the SWAT river discharges uh, taken at upstream uh, non-tidal locations that we need to, uh, to add to our computations. And then we compute, uh, the tricky part is the, the computing the wetted surface area. And we derive that from ipsometry, which is the a relation between area and height using this form formula here, which expresses the the water level as a function of, of x, the surface area here, and we have six uh, par parameters that we optimize uh, based on the data. So here's an example of how uh, it looks like again for those two same locations. So at the downstream Saint-Francois uh, location in uh, blue, you see the, the reference uh, data uh, and the full data, um, hourly data. Uh, and then the ipsometric curve that, that is generated from this complete uh, data in red. And then in yellow, you see the dots, uh, which are the SWOT-like observations. And in purple, if you can see it, is the ipsometric curve generated only based on the SWOT uh, observations, which uh, basically overlaps, overlay the, the, the red curve. So it's per, uh, doing quite well here in that case. For the Batiscan, it's also doing uh, very well, except for those uh, lower water levels um, with very few uh, SWAT observations. Uh, so there is some discrepancy in the shape of the curve will lead to some uh, uh, problems in the uh, generated surface areas. So uh, first, uh, so what we do here, let's uh, look at the first uh, location here. Uh, we have the tidal prediction from NSTide, uh, our early time series. Uh, we use this relation here to generate a uh, time series of surface area at, uh, every hour. Um, so, uh, so that's what it looks like. So same thing with the, the upstream location, tidal prediction, and then the surface uh, area that, that is generated uh, goes to zero at the, those very low level um, because of the, the shape of the curve, like I said. So it, it's not perfect, but still uh, usable. The last uh, thing we were doing is to compute the discharge with all those variables. So we are using a very simple approach, uh, which is a method of cubature, which solves the continuity equation, basically. So we do a spatial integration over, over all reaches of the temporal derivatives of the water levels uh, multiplied by the um, surface area. And we integrate over all reaches and we add the river, the upstream river discharge to that. Uh, and we, we obtain an hourly tidal discharge. The second approach here is the QMEC method, uh, which is an inverse model, which takes uh, discharge uh, generated from the cubature to determine, determine the flow log parameters. So the width, uh, depth, mean slope, and, and manning coefficient. Those four parameters can be then used uh, once optimized in a forward model to estimate the instantaneous discharge at each satellite pass over a uh, given reach. 
So this is how it per performs uh, those two locations. So uh, in blue, you have the reference discharge and in, in red, the discharge estimated from cubature um, with a zoom in over a month here. Uh, so at downstream location, it's, it's uh, reconstructing discharge very well. Upstream, there's uh, higher frequency oscillations. It's not perfect, but it's still uh, relatively good. And it captures also the, the, the low frequency uh, modulations of, of the discharge, your river discharge here. Uh, you see some stats uh, over all reaches from the cubature and the QMEC method. And when we look at the uh, model parameters for QMEC, um, they're quite realistic. They correspond to more or less what, what uh, the geometry of the rivers. Uh, so I have to uh, conclude. Um, so this is, so in summary, um, we have a first version of a package for uh, tides and discharge estimations in tidal rivers and estuaries. Um, the estimations show adequate performance, but again, we assumed no upstream river discharge errors and no errors in the SWOT observations. So um, for future work, uh, we need to do a full assessment of the methods, capabilities, and limitations. We also need to do uncertainty propagation from SWOT errors to the tidal uh, discharge estimations. And we are testing uh, also uh, some constraints mm -hmm. that we want to add to the algorithms based on uh, by solving, for example, for groups of reaches under the same orbits mm -hmm. rather than just uh, separately, each mm -hmm. reach uh, separately. Um, and using type gauge information to constrain the, uh, the analysis. Um, so I'll, I'll end here. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much, Pascal. Yeah, questions, comments for Pascal. I may ask a question. So, uh, from Andy. Oh, sorry, I'm uh, assuming here. Assuming, okay. Yeah, Pascal, I'm, it's a really fascinating talk. I'm really, really interested in this method. Just a quick question, do you have some similar analysis for the Fraser River? Um, well, my, my intent was to uh, also apply it to the Fraser River. I've, I've worked before in the Fraser a little bit, so uh, I'm, um, so NSTide was, uh, basically implemented in, in the in the Fraser so it would be relatively straightforward to um, to to apply it to the Fraser and what's interesting is that the tides are quite different there uh, there's yeah. a much stronger diurnal tide uh, in the Fraser uh, compared to the St. Lawrence so it would be interesting to see if uh, well how it behaves uh, how uh, how SWAT is able to ex to um, extract information about the diurnal tides yeah, exactly. I spent the last two years to look at the tidal influence on the Fraser River plume. And one thing I noticed that is that uh, there's some kind of temporal bias for the satellite observations. For example, the satellite only like can observe the, the plume at the, the daytime. And for the tide in the Strait of Georgia, um, the, like, the lower low tide is mostly occurred at the daytime in summertime. And the lower low tide is only found in the middle night in the winter time, which it calls a kind of, most of your ob observation in the summertime will be around the, like the big app cycle. And most of your observation in the winter time is following the like small app cycle, which calls a very important bias in, in the Strait of Georgia. Uh, so um, think, I don't know if that is the same case in the St. Lawrence River, but I think it's a very interesting point to, um, to, to be noticed in the streets of Georgia. Thank you. I agree. Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, Andy Ling. Yes, uh, I got you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, very nice talk and uh, <laughs> sounds of, uh, very uh, promising for the, for the future use. Uh, I know it's just a, a framework, but uh, you showed the, the coverage and map for global. Uh, a global map, but do you have any uh, zoom zoomed in for for Canada coast, uh, particularly for like for BC coast? Just curious. Um, well, I don't have a zoom in here uh, with me, but I, I do have the um, the shape files for the, this uh, sort of database. Uh, so basically, I mean, it's available in the form of, of, of shape files. Uh, it's publicly publicly available, so we can uh, find it on Zenodo, I think. 
Um, okay, so, I, so then yeah, you can, can visualize. Can what, yeah, you can visualize what what reaches are um, will be seen by are expected to be seen by by SWOT. Thank you. Yeah. I think certainly there's some requirement you know how wide the river is, right? So if right. it's too narrow, you know, you cannot see anyway, even with the SWAT high resolution, cannot see. Exactly, yeah. Okay, okay, thanks so much, uh, Pascal. Thank you. So at this stage, uh, I would like to thank all the speakers for their interesting talks and uh, all of you, you know, for, for participation, participating and uh, we conclude this session and uh, we, we will have third part uh, in about 20 some minutes. So yeah. please join us again you know, uh, for this coastal oceanography uh, and inland water session, part three. Thank you, bye-bye.